The most important thing we can do for ourselves is figure out what is the meaning that you've been giving money all your life. And and what my work is meant to do is not only help you bring that to the surface, but also have a way of questioning those assumptions to see, is that helping you? How's that working out for you having those beliefs? Lisa, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so happy to be here, Artie. Yeah, so you used to be a financial planner. Um, You are the author of The Mindful Millionaire and the host of The Mindful Millionaire podcast. Is there anything you'd like to add for listeners who aren't familiar with your work to know about you? I think another fun thing to check out is my YouTube channel. Lately, some things I've been creating have been taking off. So that'd be another place. Lisa Peterson, Mindful Millionaire on YouTube. Awesome. Awesome. I've finished reading your book recently. I really enjoyed it. It was a very different take than a lot of financial books I've read. So to start, I think, I mean, you go into your personal journey in the book. Maybe you can go into that a little bit to let listeners know how you got on this journey. I mean, you were, you've been in the money business for over 25 years. You left financial planning about 10 years ago. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So yeah, maybe give a little background to your story and what led you to writing the book and, and having this take on money. Yeah, I think having come from no money, it made money a very interesting topic for me. I discovered the concept of money probably at like seven or eight. And I was like, this is really cool. Like if you save some, then you can go big, buy things that... Um, you might not be able to buy if you just have a penny or a dime or a quarter. And back then in the uh, early 70s, um, that would actually buy you things. But <laughs> I really became interested in money. And um, because my parents struggled with it so much and they had not gotten more than high school education, they had never really learned much about money. They didn't, they, they tried to teach me what they could. I was really left on my own to figure it out. And so it really marked my life in that when you don't have it, but you're curious about something, you make it important to learn about it, to have it, to to, um, figure it out. And at some point along the line, I think I realized that I was a lot better at managing money than most people, especially when you don't come from it and you don't have mentors. So fast forward to the time when I had worked in the money business for all these years, I kept switching jobs because I couldn't align my morals with the work that I was doing. Every time I took a job, whether it be mortgage banking or eventually financial advising, I felt very torn. I felt like the industry was not built to educate people and inform people and empower people about their money. I felt like there was a lot of uh, abdicating going on. So abdicating our responsibilities that that we have as human beings to take good care of ourselves. We had just sort of, we do what other people do, which is spend, get in debt, not ask for a raise, not ask to be paid the kind of money that we really are, are, are making for the companies that we, we work for, you know, the value that's being created. And so uh, about 10 years ago, I sort of reached that pivotal point where I can't take this anymore. I need to go figure out how I could create a business where I can educate people and inform people and help people get out of their own way with money. Because a lot of what I noticed is people have all these emotional blocks. They have like mind blocks. They have learning blocks around thinking that they can't be good with money. And none of those are true, but there's a process in order to unravel those before people could really take good care of their money. And so over the course of this past 10 years, I've been working with people. And a lot of that is sort of funneled into the book because I wanted to make it accessible to everybody who could afford or even go to the library to get a book. Um, But I have witnessed people go from never saving money and having a whole bunch of blocks around saving money to becoming multimillionaires in a very short amount of time because they 
learned how to handle it differently because the money was coming through their lives before that, but they didn't know how to capture it, how to invest it wisely, how to do something with it so that they could build wealth. And it's been one of the most rewarding things I could have ever done to leave that industry. Even though I've made a lot less money over this time in the traditional way, it was totally worth it to do to make this switch. One of the things uh, in the welcome section when you're um, introducing yourself a bit, you lay out that it's not a positivity thing. It's it, it's positivity itself is not enough. Can you dive into that? Why? I mean, do you, do you see people getting into a, like a positivity trap often, where they think I can just think positively, and then that they just end up right back to where they are? Um, what made you point that out so early? Yeah. Because my work bridges the two worlds, the financial world as well as the self-help world. I think when I look at the people in the self-help, there's a lot of emphasis to like manifesting or think your way to riches or just think positively and everything's going to work out. And I knew for a fact that that wasn't the way that I had built my own wealth. And it's not that I'm, I am an optimist. That's one thing, but like just thinking that it's going to happen because you've got really good intentions was the thing that I wanted to dispel. And so along the way of writing the book, I came across a researcher and professor, Sonia, I'm probably going to butcher, it's like, oh, anyways, it's in the book. Well, we can write it down. (laughs) Her last name is escaping me. But she had found in all of her research that it actually hurt us when we just thought positively, because what happens is we actually don't try. We stop trying to bring the things that we want into into effect. And that is the worst thing that we could do from a practical standpoint. If you you can have a great intention, but if you don't do anything to make that happen, probably not going to happen. And that was the distinction. It wasn't just a positive mental attitude. It's also about what's the action that you're going to take with that positive mental attitude. Hmm. I like that. I've been trying to wrap my head around, you know, uh, the law of attraction, positivity kind of stuff. I don't really, uh, I don't believe in the law of attraction too much. I've talked about it with people and it it seems a little bit too religious to me um it it starts to border on religion depending on how serious people get about it but it is an interesting concept because i know there's psychological proof that like you know if you're thinking negatively all day your your day tends to go bad and you tend to make bad decisions and and make a lot of errors like if you we do self-sabotage with our negative self-talk. So I think it's really important to not talk negatively. Um, But yeah, then there's also the other side of that where people think that if you just talk positively and if you just think these positive thoughts, good things will happen. And I feel like it sets them up for failure sometimes because it's like, but just like you said, if you're not putting in the work, if you're not doing something other than just thinking positively, then what's actually going to bring those positive things into your life? Because things don't just happen typically. Yeah. I've done so much research on this. There's another professor in England by the name of Richard Wiseman, and I love his books. And he talks a lot about luck and he's studied luck. And it's so fascinating because some of the studies that he quotes in his books are what happens when we think that we're a lucky person? It's actually, it changes our whole entire life when we think we're a lucky person. So one of the studies was like, they put money all all on the pathway from where the person was going to start their journey walking, you know, think about it in England, right? So a lot of walkable communities. So they walked to a coffee shop and the people who thought that they were lucky would find and see the money Mm. on the path. The people who didn't think that they were lucky wouldn't see it. They'd miss the whole opportunity of like picking up cash on the way. So there were, there were a lot of studies. That one just comes to mind about the fact that we do get impacted in the, in our mindset. It's just the issue is, is that 
we can't leave it there. And there can be this very passive strategy. So I feel like it's filled with paradox. It's both and. You need the positive attitude to be able to uncover the opportunities, but don't just rely on that one thing. You have to, you know, bend down and pick up the money. You've got to look for it. My husband's always looking for things and he cracks me up because he finds animals and super cool things all the time because he's like, I'm a lucky person in spotting animals. So he finds them because he's looking for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting because I mean, some people might hear. Uh, that one study and say, well, luck is true then, but it, it it's not necessarily true. It's like you're creating your own luck uh, with your mindset. Like if you think, if I think I'm somebody who's lucky and finds money on the ground, I'm more likely to be looking on the ground, looking for money <laughs> and seeing those opportunities, right? Yeah, totally. It's, it, there's, I love re- reading it because sometimes I can get way too practical and be like, just, oh, you have to know it all. You have to figure it all out. And that's exhausting. And that isn't also the way to like, we can, I have to question the hustle culture at some point because you could just wear yourself out. If you're like, I've got to cover all the bases. I've got to make everything perfect and lined up. Like it's a both and. We, we have to pay attention to like our energy use. Like, is this really good time for me to be focused on this activity? Um, do I feel really energized and inspired about this? Or does it feel like a slog? If it feels like a slog, maybe I should just go spend my time finding something that is inspiring to me because you're probably not going to make a lot of money with something that wipes you out, right? Like, even if you enjoy, you might in- you might want the rewards really bad, but you don't know how to get there because it makes you so uncomfortable doing it. It's like, that's probably not a good fit. You know, so we're finding, I feel like everything's about this like user manual for life. Like what works yeah. for you? Yeah. How, so, I mean, you cover this in the book a bit, but how like part one is all about uh, a new language for personal finance. So how do you, uncover that how do you uncover what's for you um because what i one thing i loved about your book is you don't have a bunch of technical oh invest in this do this with your money like that's not what your book is about it's about changing your mindset so why don't you go into a little bit about how you start that process with people and then we can talk about the i prosper process as well yeah I think again and again, I return to a foundational understanding of money. Like I'm doing these videos on YouTube right now and I just wrote another book. And I think I, I noticed that my style is giving the reader or the person taking a workshop with me credit for the idea that they have the capacity to learn the foundation of whatever it is we're talking about. The problem is, is that many people's foundation about money is so weak that that they just haven't received education growing up about it, that didn't get talked about in their home. And the problem with that is, is if you just put a whole bunch of information into someone without a strong foundation, they don't have the ability to make good discern decisions, like discerning decisions about what do I do next? Instead, they're just like following somebody else's recipe, but the recipe is probably not going to take them to the same place that this other person went. And so I like to start at these more foundational levels. Like let's break things down. Let's make it really simple. Let's talk about what are the most important things you need to understand about what's happening here. And then empower people to know like, okay, well, here's how to make good decisions. Here's how to make better decisions about your money or about, um, you know, getting out of debt or how to buy a home. Like what is the process that you're going to go through to make sure that this makes sense for you? You're going to become more empowered to do that if you have a strong foundation. Um, with that, where does the foundation start? Like, is it the same for everybody or does that foundation change from person to person? Cause one of, one of the things that comes to mind is, and you talk about people's, you know, their childhood mattering mm-hmm. a lot in their uh, financial journey. And one of the things that comes to my mind is you can have two people that come from similar households, one, and in each household, there was a lack of money, a shortage of money. 
and uh, a, basically a scarcity mindset. And you can get two very different behaviors from that. Like one person might uh, spend everything that comes into their pocket because they they just figure, well, I don't know how to save money. I it's pointless to try to save. I'm not going to be able to save. So I just spend it because it it just flies through my hands anyway. And then another person might save every penny um, that they get. And maybe they have their own issues. Like they don't know how to actually make money with that money or or do anything. It's just sitting there and they're like, I'm saving money. But, you know, we have inflation and <laughs> saving money alone doesn't really get people places quite often. Mm -hmm. From my vantage point, it all comes down to what is the meaning? What was the meaning you were giving money when you were growing up? What was the meaning? So even in my family, I totally know exactly what you're talking about. Like my sibling and I have very different experiences about money. And so what I can say is the meaning that I gave to money early in life was this is security, this is stability, this will bring me happiness. I need to understand it and take control of it. That was the meaning I gave to money from a very young age. Okay, you, you can feel how strong that is. Like if somebody has a young, if you're a young mind and those are beliefs you have, for better or for worse, there's a good chance that person's going to have a lot more money than the average person on the planet because you're yeah. going to go out and find it. On the flip side, I can only suspect, but you know, this will be more of a collection of, of my family and people that I've worked with over the years. Many people give money, uh, something like, I don't understand it. It's caused a lot of pain in my life. When I get it, I'm very uncomfortable with it. So I try to get rid of it as fast as possible. Um, it doesn't actually make me feel safe having it, hmm. which seems counterintuitive as a human being that we would do that. But I think a lot of people feel that way about money. And so the life that you build, if you don't feel safe or comfortable with it or in control of it, oh, the other one is I am a victim to money. Like that's a big one that a lot of people have not even uncovered yet. And, and the reason I'm bringing these out is the most important thing we can do for ourselves is figure out what is the meaning that you've been giving money all your life. And, and what my work is meant to do is not only help you bring that to the surface, but also have a way of questioning those assumptions to see, is that helping you? How's that working out for you having those beliefs? Like, do you want to keep those beliefs? Cause you, you know, if you want to keep them, you're going to keep them. But if you do not want them anymore and you see how destructive or harmful they've been in your path in the past, you're going to take action to changing them. You're going to start questioning the assumptions that you've been making all your life. And to me, that is the biggest foundational change is now instead of letting a seven-year-old, because Research says that we've got a lot of these ideas about money already built in by the age of seven. So hmm. our seven-year-old is actually running the show more than, you know, the 30, 40, 50-year-old is. If you don't understand what that whole philosophy is, you know, and for many of us, it's unconscious. So we have, we have to dig deeper. Like I figured out that I could be a great financial advisor. I could be the best mortgage banker in the world. I could be so good at helping people. But there wasn't enough time in that role for me to sit down with people and help them unpack what are these beliefs that you've got about money. And, and I knew that if I didn't do that, I would only be able to help the people who are already good at money, but I wouldn't be able to help the people that weren't good with money change. That makes sense. Um... When it comes to the language that we use, are there certain things that do apply to everybody, in your opinion? Like, are there certain things that everyone should avoid and everyone should be doing? Probably very few. <laughs> I 
Like we all come from different backgrounds. We all have different experiences. And I think that's why I didn't write a prescriptive book because I didn't want to make assumptions of where people were coming from because what's what's a good decision for me right now in in my evolution of being a multimillionaire is a very different approach than I'm going to tell somebody who's just starting out. I mean, however, you know, what's the basics? Like spend less than you earn. If you yeah. don't earn enough money because your spending is is already tight and you still can't make it, go figure out another job, go get training, go question everyone that you possibly know of what is it going to take for me to make more money? Like, this is where I'm at. Be honest with people, find those mentors, question everybody, you know, why is this not coming together? Like, why am I barely making ends meet? Because in our society, that is not an acceptable solution and and you should not be comfortable there. Yeah. How do you go about finding a mentor? Because we live in a world of keeping up with the Joneses where there's a lot of people who are trying to give the impression of wealth, but they often are living in debt and don't actually, and some, some of these people have very good incomes and they, they just don't necessarily, they've obviously learned how to make money, but they haven't really figured out how to manage it. But if you're, if you're not savvy yourself, you might see somebody like that and assume that they're doing really well and that's somebody that you want to mentor you. So what are some of the things that people should be looking for with a mentor and maybe avoiding? Yeah. I think that it's true. You want to choose your mentors very wisely. I think that if you are in a situation where something is going to cost a lot of money and you're looking at like, getting into your retirement account, which a lot of people will do, or um, putting things on in on debt to like be able to work with a mentor, I would question that assumption deeply because I have not come across anything where the amount of money when people are charging a ton of money to help you and they don't have easy and very affordable, if not free options to get started. Like I just think, unfortunately, there's a lot of deception out there. And and here's a side note that just came to me. So I've been out in, in the public world for 10 years. I have been interviewed hundreds and hundreds of times. My interviews have, have reached millions and millions of people. Like mind boggling that, that I'm out there in that way. Like I never would have imagined. But here's what I want to say to you. It is very rare that some, and I'm super easy to access. Like you can find my email in so many different places. I probably have had in that 10 years, maybe five to 10 people, you know, often young men or women anywhere in the world reach out and say, Hey, you know, what would, do you take, you know, mentees or what would be the best approach? Or can you help me here? Because I don't have a lot of resources, you know, because and and it doesn't even matter if they had resources, but it's very rare when people reach out and I am like the most accessible person. Like I'm going to help people no matter what. I love doing that. I am a super abundant person because I don't have to work for money anymore. And, and like, I just think that people aren't taking initiative enough in believing that there are a lot of people like myself who would be happy to help. And I mean, I have a Facebook group. I have very low cost communities that come together on a regular basis. They're pay what you can. Like I do everything in my power and I am shocked at how few people actually take take advantage of it. And I don't think I'm alone. I think there's a lot of people that are like me that would help, um, but nobody asks. Why do you think that is like, do you think it's, you think it's people looking at you and just assuming that you're too busy to have time for their thing or is it a lack of confidence or just fear of rejection? Probably a combination of all of those, right? Yeah. I think that we live in a world now where, you know, social media, I mean, if you, if you, 
you know, I don't have a lot of people on social media compared to like my daughter runs a very successful company and I think she's, you know, got more than half a million people. Like if you reach out to somebody who's got half a million people or a million or several million people and you're like, Hey, be my mentor. Like they're never really going to see your stuff, but there's a lot of us that don't have huge social media followings. If I get a message on social media, I'm probably going to respond to it as long as they're not totally weird and kind of alarming in the way that they're <laughs> approaching it. So I think that it's, there's this fascination with fame. There's this thought that if you have more people, then you are smarter or more successful or better. And I mean, I hate to tell you folks, but like, there's a lot of people that have huge followings that are, I mean, maybe they're great at that, but they're not great at the stuff that we're talking about here. Like they're still yeah. trying to figure it out. They come to me for help with that. So don't just rely on numbers. And if you go to people that have huge numbers, you're probably not going to get through the sea of like activity. And yeah, I mean, if you read a book and there, if somebody's on Instagram and they don't have millions of followers, like, say something, reach out, yeah. tell them, I enjoyed this book. Like see if they respond because if they do, then there's maybe an opportunity to say, Hey, do you ever have programs, you know, that are affordable? Like ask the questions, take initiative. Every single person that I have met and mentored over this past 35 years that has taken initiative and really shown up, whether it be in an internship or you know, they, they lead by saying, is there anything I can do for you? Because I would love to just work with you or be with you or like see, you know, work on a project with you. Um, they, so many of these people have gone on to like own multi million dollar companies later in life. Like I'm blown away at just that one step of initiative until they get the answer they want seems to have a lot to do with their ability to build wealth later in life. Yeah. What what are your thoughts for creative people? People that want to make money with creative endeavors, which is difficult. I mean, I'm running a podcast. I want to make this into a career. It is difficult. Like these things are not easy. People that want to create art, especially with AI now making uh, another competitor for those people. But people who want to make music, make art, make anything that traditionally doesn't uh, come with a large guarantee of revenue. How do you advise people for managing that path? Mm -hmm. The more creative endeavor oriented your work is, the riskier it is, I think, for the most part. So that means only a certain number of them are going to succeed. And I think that because my focus is around money, what I always like to tell my clients is if they're starting a new venture and it's really a passion play, like it's something they're so inspired about. They know that this is what they're supposed to be doing. If they need money, if they need an income, it's a good idea to have that be something on the side so that your need for money doesn't infect the creative endeavor and the the things that you're trying to do. I think I really messed up in this when I first started my business is I was very focused on, okay, I've got to make money. I went cold turkey. I got this business. And I think it took me longer to figure out had I how to make money had I just focused on like, okay, this is what I really want to do. It isn't about the money. I'm just going to do absolutely phenomenal work. I'm going to make sure that it's really touching with the audiences that I'm talking about. I'm not going to make it about money. I'm going to make it about service and value and finding my audience. And really in the world that we are in today, I think niching is really, really important. Like go after that small group. Be You have to be exclusive to be inclusive. So you, what's going to be the thing that's going to be very exclusive in what you do to find those people and then those people enjoy? It doesn't take millions of people. You could have a very successful business with a thousand people in your community if everybody's really excited about what you're doing. So that's my thought is make sure that you don't have all your eggs in that one basket. Understand that the risks are really high. Give yourself a couple years on the new venture. And really hone in on like, when do people get really excited? And if they don't, then keep trying because your job is to find 
I love this quote by Frederick Buckner, like where your greatest joy meets the world's greatest needs. Um, and that can take many years to figure out like, where is that intersection? And you're going to probably try a lot of different things before you find it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, one of the things that comes to mind though is, uh, people might look at that situation and say, well, the prospects of making money in what I want to do are pretty low. And I can make a lot of money in this other career that would give me no satisfaction, but it would leave no time for what I want to do because it would be very, very taxing. How do, how can people find that right balance there? We're like, okay, I need a job. I don't need $200,000 a year. I can live mm -hmm. off of $50,000, $60,000 a year and then do what I love versus, you know, going all in just for the money mm -hmm. and maybe burning themselves out and losing their passion a bit. Yeah, no, I think that's a great idea. I think that um, if you were used to making more money and now you're downsizing to a different career so that you have more time and you have more space, it is probably helpful to note that it often takes some time to make changes if you weren't living really frugally before uh, because your lifestyle is going to change. There's going to have to be a lot of changes perhaps with the people that you hang out with or conversations about like why you're doing things differently or with your family. Like, why can't you afford to buy a plane ticket? You know, like whatever it is, like you're going to have to be very comfortable in that scrappy role. If, if you're just being able to barely pay your, you know, living expenses, for example. So I think that there's some mindset preparation that we can do of like, Hey, it's worth it to me. And these are the sacrifices I'm going to make. Because I think what often I'm saying this out of experience, people downsize, but they don't change their spending behavior. And then they get into a ton of debt. Mm. So now they got this job that's got this time, but they're so stressed out about this growing looming debt ball, you know, that snowball that, that they don't know how to deal with. Um, I just truly believe that we are creative beings. And if we have a ton of stress on us, we lose a lot of our creativity from that scarcity mindset. Yeah, I agree with that. Could you dive into what scarcity and abundance are? Because I feel like a lot of, I feel like this is talked about by a lot of people, but it seems like there, maybe not everybody, but there are a lot of people that don't quite grasp the concepts or, or distort the concepts. Like I've seen people talk about abundance, but they're basically talking about positivity. They're, they're saying, I just don't worry about it because I figure more is coming. And it's like, it's a little bit deeper than that, you know? And, uh, yeah. scarcity, I think s scarcity is something I only learned about over the last five, or so years. Uh, my girlfriend talks about scarcity mindsets and I, I find it useful. I'm like, oh, okay. And she'll point out like, oh, that's scarcity mindset. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. And yeah, I'm just wondering if you can explain mm -hmm. for listeners what those two things are and maybe mm -hmm. what they're not too. Mm, that's a good question. I like to take it to a very high level and then we can kind of dive deeper. So scarcity is when we're consumed with there not being enough of a resource, you know, money in this case, or feeling like we are not enough. Like we don't have that resource. We don't have that education. We don't measure up to other people. So whenever we're consumed by not enoughness ourselves or some kind of resource, that's scarcity mindset. So we're looking at the world through that lens. And sadly, the research says that we become extremely myopic. We have a really hard time seeing outside of that very narrow way of looking at the world or that situation. And so it's harmful to us because scarcity decisions typically cause more problems. They don't get us out of the challenging situation that we're faced but but it's just a natural response. So we've, we sort of have to train ourselves to be more with this abundant mindset. So the abundant mindset says, I am enough and I have enough. And that is a really hard state. They're both hard statements in a world that's filled with like crazy wealth, with very polished 
images, right, on the in, through the media or social media. Like there are so many things that we could point to and be like, well, okay, this is me in a bathing suit and this is them. Obviously, that's not enough. You know, like I'm making fun of it, but it's very easy to focus on all the not enoughs. And so again, a mindset shift says that if if we want an abundant mindset, it's not just going to be because you're telling yourself that. You actually have to believe it. And so to me, it's years and years of inner work to be able to question every assumption as it comes at you and be like, is that true? You know, am I really not enough here? Like, where does that come from? Is that really how I want to live my life? Or can I see, you know, there I am doing the best possible job I could do in any given moment. And the reason I know that is because that's what happened. It's this very like full way of looking at life. Can't carry grudges around. Can't feel like a victim. That's not what, I mean, abundance mindset. You do not get an abundant mindset from feeling like a victim or being taken advantage of. Doesn't mean you don't get hurt or bad things happen to you. But at the end of the day, you have to be able to see beyond those really shitty things that have happened to you and say, okay, I survived it. I'm still here. You know, I may be barely getting by, but I will not let that event define me. Like it, it, it could have been horrible. It could have been terrible. It's not to say I'm responsible for it because I think we get into all these really weird places when we do that. But we can say it happened and I refuse to let my life be defined by that event here or into the future. Abundant mindset. Um, yeah, there's so many things that I've noticed we have to do to unpack the scarcity way of looking at the world and then slowly but surely drop all of that away to the point where we wake up one day and we're like, oh my gosh, like it's easy to live in an abundant life because I've changed my mind and how I see everything happening in my life. Whether it's good or bad, I'm able to transform it. Could you dive into how that transformation happened for yourself a little bit? Because you were making good money, Mm -hmm. and you still had a scarcity mindset, which people might think is counterintuitive because uh, I would imagine some people think what you actually are bringing in, what you can actually do would influence scarcity and abundance versus uh, obviously in your book, you laid this out pretty well that no, it's, it's an inner thing. And that's what you're saying now, but maybe... I don't know, dive into a little bit about your personal journey with that and why you were dealing with a scarcity mindset, even though you had a lifestyle or uh, the ability to have an abundant lifestyle with that mindset change and like what actually made that happen. Yeah, Uh, definitely lots of bridges that had to be crossed. Um, there were pivotal moments over this past 10 years that I try a lot to capture in The Mindful Millionaire. And then I've written a new book that's in a parable format. Um, and, and it's been teaching me like about this evolution because, you know, when you're living something, you're not like always just taking notes to be like, oh, <laughs> there's this and there's that and there's this. Yeah. What I can say is... um There was a pivotal moment that occurred that was very life-changing for me around permission. And who would have thought that up until that moment, I had never given myself permission to think abundantly or live abundantly. Like it was really like a light switch going on where in the past, there must have been a part of me that... um, felt like I was blowing in the wind. Even though I was a very type A driven person, there was a part of me that felt like life was happening to me a lot more than I was the creator of the life that I want to live. And when this realization came, 
you have permission. You, Lisa, have to give yourself permission to start living from this place of creation rather than believing that it's just happening because this happened or that happened or karma or whatever it was that I would get wrapped up in. And so permission was a big flip for me. Another was realizing just how many self-worth challenges I still had that I was confronting. And and I'm going to take everybody back for a second. My dad was um, unfortunately brutally murdered in 1999. And before that, I had not really been on much of a spiritual, a knowing spiritual journey. So, you know, 25 years ago that happened. And just like anything that I've ever done, like if I dive in after his death, I was I felt incredible guilt. We were estranged for many years. Um, We hadn't spoken Uh, the way that he had died. I felt like I could have done something had I been in his life. Like the grief and the guilt and the shame was just so strong. I was like, I can't actually stay living with these feelings. I have to do something. And I went down the path of this kind of going into meditation and a spiritual journey. So I just say that because... I had this huge switch, but I did that from like 1999 to 2014 when I started this company. And even though I'd been excavating my mind, my beliefs, my daily practices, like I was examining everything under the sun, I still had incredibly low self-worth in comparison to what I needed to be able to be a a successful business owner, to be able to influence millions of people's lives. Like I did not feel confident about myself in a way that would actually make the kind of impact in the world that I felt like I was here to make. And so this past 10 years was... I think becoming a business owner is one of the most incredible teachings that we can possibly have as a human being. When we go from sort of the gravy train, even though we worked really hard, there still was the system that we were just fitting into to like creating out of thin air and like what it takes and who you have to be to be like a reliable, supportive mentor or coach to people, which is one of the things that I've done. So I'm totally lost my train of thought, but I'm just explaining that there was a lot of transformation that's gone on over this past 25 years to allow me to get to the place where I can change my thoughts, change my beliefs in a matter of minutes. If something appears in my life now and it doesn't help me, I'd be like, Ooh, that's dangerous. I understand. I, I see it coming. And then I'd be like, okay, what's, what's the way that I need to think going forward? And that's what I tried to teach in, in the mindful millionaire and also in this new book. Awesome. Um, we, I don't have kids, but I have parents and, um, I, I think everyone gets to a certain stage in their adult life at some time, maybe in their twenties, where they, where they realize that their parents were just kids too. Or they're like, oh, my parents were just kids, young adults, trying to figure it out too. Because I think every, I don't know if a perfect family relationship exists. I think everyone has some like little weirdness in their family. Like no parents perfect. They all make mistakes. They're all just trying to figure it out, doing the best that they can ideally. And even in the best of situations, you're going to have some mistakes that those parents make. How do you like, so if a parent picks up your book and they, they want to start getting better, how do they balance that? Like, I want to understand this stuff and I want my kid to learn this stuff too. Um, how does somebody that is a parent navigate these waters while also trying to set their kids up for the best life possible with the best mindsets because they're, if this is a journey that's going to take them for several years, at least Mm -hmm. how do they make sure that they're not doing more damage than necessary while they're figuring this stuff out? Yeah. (laughs) What I think is funny is oftentimes people who are on these journeys to sort of unpack and release the things that aren't serving them, you'll hear them 
talk about like, okay, kids, I know you're going to need therapy. I'll pay for it later. I promise I'm here for you. You know, like they'll make it a joke because there's an, uh, there's a humility that goes along with the inner journey that causes you to realize that you're probably making a lot of mistakes and that you've probably made a lot of mistakes up to this point in time. The thing about it though, is that I think our kids, just like you said, our kids don't expect us to be perfect, not deep inside. That's not what's important to them, that that we're perfect. What they do care about is, are we listening? Hmm. Are we like a a good listener? Because if we're a good listener, that means the communication um, pathway is open both ways. It's not just us as a parent telling our kids everything. I would say my kids, because of my journey and doing all of this work, I'm a really good listener and my kids know that. And I don't profess to have been the perfect parent in any way, shape or form, but they do know that the door is always open and that these conversations can happen. My kids are both really, really good with money. But even the other day, my son showed up and we took a different approach. Some parents are like, okay, kids, we're going to teach you all this stuff about money and you're going to remember it. And we're going to, you know, take some of your money and put it in the bank. And we're going to, and you got to give some of your money away. You've got to tithe it. Like we weren't those parents. I let my kids fail miserably in their attempts to figure it out. And I was always there with a supportive, like, okay, well, okay, that's upsetting. Like, let's talk about why that was upsetting to you. Like why you have no money to buy this thing because you just bought everybody at 7-Eleven, you know, sodas last week, you know, like let's talk about that. So I would wait for the real life experiences to like happen. But the other day my son showed up and he's at home for um, the summer for college. He'll be a sophomore. And he's like, mom, how could you have never taught me about compounding interest? And he starts saying, you know, if you had invested a thousand dollars when I was like born, you know how much money I'd have right now? You know, he's, he's, this is how he's thinking. I was like, well, the reason I didn't teach you about that is you never wanted to listen to those conversations when I wanted to have them. You know, I am waiting for you to ask me those questions. So it sounds like you learned pretty well, like you've already got it figured out and you're thinking, why didn't I do all these things for you? But I'm pretty happy. And and then that opened up a conversation. And the next thing I know, he was agreeing to read a book that a good friend of mine wrote called The Simple Path to Wealth by J.L. Collins about very basic investing strategies. And he was, he's like, yep. I promise I'll read it. I'm like, I will buy that book for you. Let's get it going on. And I'm sure more conversations are going to happen. But um, my point would be back to kids and your question. First of all, if you are really crappy with money, they are going to learn your behavior more than anything else. They are not going to listen to what you tell them. So if you do one thing and you try and teach them another, it's probably sending a lot of mixed messages and maybe it'll work out, but there's a good chance they're going to be more like doing what you did. So my husband and I are pretty good with money. The kids seem to follow in our steps and then they know that we're available to them and they're open to having the conversations when they're in situations that could be precarious about money. So you got to learn yourself as the parent and then and then model it for your children. Don't expect them to be great with money if you haven't figured it out. I love that. I I really like the lesson that or your son coming up to you and asking about the compound interest. Seems like there's a good lesson there because it's like, okay, yeah, if I had done that 20 years ago, you'd have this much money now. Imagine what you can have in 20 years if you do it now. <laughs> you know? so. Yeah, yeah, totally. He's just like all those... He's like, mom, I want to retire when I'm 40. I'm like, great. We can, I can help you do that. You know, like yeah. good to set that goal at 19. What is that, that brings to mind? What does retirement mean? <laughs> For me? <laughs> I mean, what should it mean? Cause when I, when I think of retirement, I've seen people retire. And one of the things I've found is I think retirement kind of kills people in in some regards. I think like if you, I think it's great if you can step away and be like, I don't have a need to work, but I feel like everyone should continue working essentially until they die. (laughs) 
not like work, work I know, but like doing I know. something that they love to do. Yeah. A friend of mine, Jillian Johnsrud, she is um, known for talking about retire often. Hmm. And so I love that term and I love that idea. And I feel like I'm sort of doing that. Um, I feel like I retired from my career and part of the reason it also took me a while to make money in that first couple of years was I was so burnt out and so exhausted from the grind of whatever, 25 years of working for other people. Even though I started, I started a new business and there was probably a like retirement thing going on. And then eventually I figured it out with my business. Recently, I shut down a lot of my business to focus on my, on my husband's um, recovery from cancer and I um, feel like it was another retirement. And I and every time I do it, I, like, I'm not sure what's going to happen next. But what I love about retiring often and not looking at it as a destination more than just like a temporary thing is that it gives us the chance to like go back to our creative roots and figure out like, ooh, what are you curious about? What might you do? Um There are plenty of examples of people and you probably have met them. I mean, you go to Home Depot, you'll meet these guys. I don't know. They're in their 60s or 70s and they are having the time of their life. Like they are so happy to have that job and they're having a great time because they're around young people. There's this energy is keeping them alive and happy and social. Whereas if maybe they don't need the money, but they need that in their lives. And I think we the great thing about knowing ourselves really, really well is that we make better decisions for like, well, where am I going to be happiest? You know, like it's probably not for many of us going to be just like traveling the world over and over again for the rest of our lives. Like I get tired of traveling. I, I've tried that recently and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's not the answer. Like I can only do this yeah. for so long. Yeah, I like that. I, I think a lot of people, I mean, myself included, when I think when the, Word vacation, or sorry, when the word uh, retirement is said, I think of like a vacation essentially. Like <laughs> I like a beach. I like to sit on the beach and go in the ocean. And it's like I think a lot of people will think of retirement as just doing what they like to do on a vacation indefinitely. Mm-hmm. But I think most people haven't thought that through, and that uh, are still stuck on that mindset because it's like, yeah, no, that will get be pretty boring pretty fast. Like. You could do that for a week. Like a vacation is a vacation. It's a step away from what you want to do uh, regularly. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that's much of a retirement. I think most people would go insane in that kind of retirement. Yeah. When we we did a retirement, a little retirement in 2015, and we took my son out of fifth grade for the year and we traveled and we were in Hawaii for a while. And it was like the, on the third week, maybe not even three weeks. I don't even think he made it that long. My husband's like, I think I'm going to get a job. And I was like, we're not even here for that long. What are you talking about? And he's like, I'm going crazy. Like He couldn't handle it. I was like, we've only been gone for like a couple of weeks and you want to get a job, you know, like let's unpack that, you know, like yeah. <laughs> he had to like retrain his brain to like, just enjoy life. He wasn't used to it. It was really funny. He got used to it later, though. He did enjoy himself, but it took a while. He had to have some break th- breakdowns to breakthroughs before he could like enjoy himself. Do you, do you think that's more of? Is it part of like people like routine, or a lot of people like routine, and and like there there are things that jobs offer people that we don't we don't always consider until we step away from a job. Like if you're at a job and it's an on-site job, you get like you get some social time with people, you get to talk with people outside of your home because as much as we, as we love the people in our homes, sometimes it can be like you you want to get out and talk to somebody else and like just have a different mindset for a bit and or have some different conversations. And then there's the routine aspect. Like we like to have some kind of like I can expect this and this that day, you know, that the job routine and like feeling useful and all these things. Yeah. Was it some of that for him? I think that feeling useful, I think that's a really big deal. And keep in mind, my husband's a general contractor. And so even though we were traveling 
that year, I could still keep my business going because it was an information oriented business. So I could work and see clients anywhere in the world. He was used to like the hammer, the nail, the building. So he didn't feel useful. And that feeling was really, really uncomfortable for him. And that is a, it, that's the case for a lot of people. I think going back to your comment about people dying in retirement, like, a lot faster than they thought that they, you know, they were healthy. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're like, wait, what happened? It's because they no longer feel useful to society. And I think that's a tragedy. Like nobody, I don't think I will ever, I love what we're this business that we're in because when you're creating information and you have a community, like you can do it until you take your last breath as long as your mind stays sharp, right? And maybe not yeah. even that matters. But I don't think I ever want to like not be useful to a group of people. Yeah, I think that useful aspect is really important. And I agree. I think when it, when you're in an information uh, career, I think it's a little bit easier to just keep going and going. Because I mean, I think about this, I'm like, I can do this forever i think i i really could i mean i might take a step back and do it less frequently and stuff like that over time but um i could see myself interviewing people for a really long time uh because i i'm a reader i love to read and like talking to authors is one of my favorite things now <laughs> i'm like yeah oh, this is so cool i've been a reader my whole life and now i'm interviewing people after reading their books it's it's just a dream come true, honestly. Yeah. So I, I think it's really important. I think the information careers are really good for that because you, you could just kind of do them indefinitely. And like hard labor, a little bit differently. It, mm -hmm. it, it taxes your body. What do you think for people that, I mean, your husband's a general contractor. How do people that are used to physically doing things with their body for their jobs, how do they find something to be useful? when they step away from the career that they were doing or a career in general? We're still figuring that one out. Like, I think it's really, really hard. Um, because, you know, back to when we were talking about that couple year time, when you're not really sure if something's going to work, like imagine the thing that you were doing, you can't do it anymore because of the infrastructure or what have you, you know, um, or your body just won't do it anymore. And then anything you're going to start might have like a couple year window of figuring it out. There's like a lot of risk taking involved. I think that not everybody has that in them. And so, uh, we would have to push ourselves. And, and my husband and I talk about this a lot, like, because he's like, oh, okay, maybe we'll do another fixer or maybe we'll do another real estate proper project. And I'm like, we don't really need to do that. Like, there's so many things that you could do. I think this is when, you know, have being in partnership or having, you know, the back to the mentors, having people that like can say, Hey, you know, you're really, really good at this. Like, this is something you could run with and be supportive about what that beginning looks like, because the beginning is going to be the hardest part, the inertia of trying something new. But, um, I think that's the joy of life is pushing yourself, you know, to try these different things because information, you know, you think of everyone who retires, like there are probably some things that you are really, really, really good at. And yet you haven't had the time to explore those. And would other people benefit by you sharing about that? And I think that's the cool thing about YouTube, especially for men, is it's like my husband says, pretty much anything you want to do, you can probably find somebody on YouTube who's done it, who can show you. And it's like, well, what could you show other people? I don't know. We'll see. I know not everybody's cut out for it, but I think it's a pretty cool opportunity to keep adding value to others. Yeah, and that's a really good point. I mean, we talked about mentorship, kind of uh, the onus being on the person who wants to get mentored, but maybe people who have the ability to mentor people should have their eyes open and watching for people that could use their help too. And you know, if they feel inclined, do something like YouTube or some kind of information thing where they can share that to a wider audience too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's also, you know, one of the things my husband and I have been talking about too, is like, 
investing and like learning more. I've always been the person who's managed and invested the, our money and um, diving down the rabbit hole of like dividend stock investing, for example, which is something I love, but I just haven't had the time to like focus on it and learn all the ins and outs and do it. But like, there's so many possibilities, especially in the world of finance that somebody could start to get really geek geek out on and learn and actually add value and make money with, because if you have some money and you can invest it, like it's just going to take studying and trying and doing things. So I just wanted to put also that plug in that possibilities are endless. It's just figuring out like what sounds interesting. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so what is I prosper? And you already talked about permission, which is number six on that. Um, mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how you came up with I Prosper and and maybe go through each one? Or right, so I can list them. So I Prosper, intention, pattern, reclaiming your feelings, opportunity, story, permission, evidence, and uh, reinvent. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's great. I know I don't I don't have them all memorized like I used to. And the whole idea of I prosper is that if you want to reinvent your relationship with money, here's a, um, can't say simple, here's a way to do it. Like, keep in mind, when I wrote this book, I had been coaching people for five years at the time um, and learning about what caused people to change their philosophy and change their approach to money. And I wanted to capture that in a process. So that's what I prosper is. It's like these steps that you can go through if you're really serious about changing your mindset around money. And so each of these stages, like the intention, right? That, that begins the process. I for I prosper uh, setting a strong intention of what you want and then moving into something like pattern. Pattern is all about what's that overarching pattern that's happening in your life with money. What do you keep doing over and over again? That's kind of driving you nuts. Like, can you be honest about that pattern? The next step is around, um, reclaiming your feelings. And this one was huge. This is one of those pivotal, I think each of these have been like breakthroughs for me that I was like, wait a minute, my whole life like looked one way. And then, and then the way I I think of a breakthrough is like, you were thinking it was this way. And then all of a sudden this whole other possibility opens up. And so each of these represent different breakthroughs that I had to have personally, but reclaiming your feelings. What I found is that unfortunately, when we do get education about money, it's just like, dollars and cents. It's very logic based. And yet a lot of our challenges with money are emotionally oriented, are feeling oriented. So if we don't learn how to own our feelings and feelings and emotions are a little different than each other, I'll just say the emotion would be like, I'm sad because I just received sad news. So that is like, sadness is an emotion. Feeling is different in that it's even further deeper inside of us. And so even in the case of sadness, it's kind of like, why do I feel sad? Like, what is the feeling underneath sadness? And you and I both know from experience that (laughs) we're very complicated as human beings. And so Sadness could be like, I I just missed out on something. So I'm really, really sad about that. That's like one reason that we might feel sad. The feeling underneath it is I missed out. But another could be like um, very harmful to ourselves. Like I'm an idiot. You know, like I don't like myself and I don't approve of myself. And we go down this feeling of just like, really harsh thoughts about ourselves. And so what I found is, is we actually have to understand the feelings underneath what's going on. And so we pay attention to our emotions, but we ask deeper questions. And when we start to do that, what happens is we're like, oh, um, back to when I said, you know, we what is the meaning that we give money? Like we start realizing 
the answers to those questions. Like, oh, all along I've been giving money. I've been making money all about a measurement of my own self-value, which is like the worst possible thing we can do with money. So if I have a lot of money, I'm a great person. If I have very little money, I am a loser. Like that is a using mo- money as a like measuring stick of our own yeah. success. So yeah, there's a lot there. Um, any questions about either of those? <laughs> I don't know if we're going to go through all of them, but I'm just kind of setting no. up. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, uh, and, and the emotion and the feeling being different. Uh, I guess you could be sad, but the underlying emotion, uh, or sad would be the emotion, but the feeling is like you're lost and don't know what you're, you feel confused and you're just without direction. Um, mm-hmm. so that would be more the feeling or yeah, feeling, <laughs> uh, but the emotion would be sadness from that. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. You're just trying to understand why you feel the way you do, because let's face it, if you feel negatively about anything, that is going to be a very different response than if you feel positive about something or you can transform it into something positive, right? So instead of I failed, I am looking at it like, oh, thank goodness, that was just one more failure on my way to success. Like I needed these failures to be able to figure out the answer, like completely different experiences. And what I found also back to scarcity is it's the question throughout the Mindful Millionaire is not about just having more money, like go There are plenty of books out there. That's all they care about is like more money is equals better. What I figured out is you could have all the money in the world and still be completely miserable. And that was the question I wanted to solve is like, how do we make sure that doesn't happen? So you can be creating tons of money from a scarcity standpoint. And no matter how much money you get, and this is the billionaires, many of the billionaires that we have on the planet, they do not care. It is all about getting more and more because they are operating from a scarcity mindset. They're just like, more is better. In what way exactly? Like you have more money than God. Like your world is not going to change. Like... Elon Musk is an interesting one. We'll just dive in there because I I have all these thoughts. So I'm just going to like share them. So first of all, Elon does not give to causes. Like he's not known as a philanthropist. He's not decided that yet. Okay. He he gives to political causes. Those are very different because political causes are like, you scratch my back, I'm going to scratch yours. That's not like donating to like nonprofits to make the world a better place. However... One of the things that he does do that a lot of people don't is he is willing to take his own and other people's money and invest in like super risky projects that have no idea if they're going to work out or not, which um, is to me admirable because one of the problems we have in in America right now is um, there's a lack of risk taking. And this is something that doesn't show up for like 10 years or 20 years. Like our companies are not taking enough risk anymore. They'll go do a buy a stock buyback instead of investing in building a warehouse or investing in jobs or training people for a new way or creating totally innovative products. Like there isn't enough investing being done in that because the short term payout in a stock buyback is the money goes to the investors and they all look great and the CEOs get a lot of money. But 10 years years from now, they get it, they get hurt by that, by not making long-term investments. So anyways, that's my rant, but, um, it's just interesting to like, look at scarcity mindset and how it shows up because we have a way of thinking that these billionaires are like operating from an abundant mindset. And most of them are not, it's a very different way we can. And, and so I feel like when we excavate and we look at like, am I creating 
from a place of scarcity or am I creating from an abundance mindset? They're going to look very, very different. One is coming from fear of not having enough. One is coming from, there is already enough. I just want to make the world a better place. Hmm. That makes sense. I, and the accumulation of assets and wealth indefinitely does seem to conjure up. I've always, I've never called it a scarcity mindset, but it seemed like that to me because it seems like some people are, it's like, well, what is the point of accumulating more and more wealth? Like you're not, there's nothing more that you're going to be able to do with it. You know, Mm -mm. like you're just, you know, I look at someone like Jeff Bezos and it's like, is he going to benefit from having another billion dollars? No, like there's, there's going to be no change to his life. And yeah. I, I agree with what you're saying about risk taking too, because I've been in the corporate world. I know a little bit about what it's like and I can see things. And in general, I, I think you're right. I think people, I don't know if it's just the way the market is situated with the stock market, stock market being the priority of all markets. And the most important thing is your stock price at all times. Cause it's like, I think it decentivizes long-term strategy to a yeah. large degree. Yeah. I don't, I wish the incentive structure was changed on that a bit, but I think we're, we're too attached to it right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. More is better. We're based yeah. on a system of thinking more is better. I feel like I'm saying something different. I'm saying, could you actually decide when is enough enough? Why does this have to be all about your pride? I mean, one person thinking they're better than everybody else because they have more money. Like, it's funny because rats actually behave that way. Like rats, like go to the, you know animals will try, like if you've ever found a rat's nest, like they'll go out and collect as much stuff as possible and like stuff it in there, even though they can't use all the food, they can't do anything with it. It's just finding it. And it's like, I think we're more evolved than a rat. But to me, a lot of times these people have just totally lost their way. And it's really sad. And the world suffers because that money is just sitting there for them. Whereas there's all these people that could put it to good use. Like, let's just start there. Right. Like I think, you know, Kiva, I don't know if you know about Kiva, but it's a a beautiful organization, worldwide organization where you can, let's say you have a couple hundred bucks and you go into Kiva and you can pick um, men and women who are doing these micro enterprises all over the world. And you put the, you can take the 200 and you can give 25 to this person and 25 to that person. And this person's going to buy like a cow. I mean, it's basic stuff. And then they're going to use that money to like buy the cow and then they pay the money back. And like, I've never not had money be paid back. And so they want to pay it back because then you can take that money and give it to somebody else. And you can just create this like amazing infrastructure of goodwill and helping people that can put that money to good use. Like, why not that? You know, like there's incredible, um, resourcefulness in human beings that I believe in to the end of time. Like, that's what I'm curious about. Yeah. Was that K-I-V-A? I've never heard uh, of that. K-I-V-V-A. Yeah, K-I-V-A. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So it's yeah. like micro lending for yeah. like very specific, like basic startups. Yeah, all okay. over the world, in Africa, cool. in India, in the US, like you name it, you can pick where you want to go, what's going on. It's amazing. Really cool. I would love for you to dive into uh, the hero's journey a little bit. Like, why is the hero's journey relevant to people and their money journey? Well, the hero's journey, right? The the classic journey that Joseph Campbell spoke about, Star Wars, you know, all most movies um, kind of take that character on a journey of self discovery, and I think it's fun. Sometimes, well, especially when we're trying to change our life to become a witness to our story rather than being inside of the story. 
And the hero's journey is a great way, instead of it being Luke Skywalker, in this case, you're the hero. Like, what does that look like? Where where have you been? Where are you going? What still hasn't revealed itself to you? And so I, I like to use the hero's journey to encourage people to say, well, look at your life. Look at where you've been. Look at what you still have to learn or where you might be stuck. And, and realize that there's a cycle to this experience. Um, and I guess to me, the, there's this great video. I'll, I'll give it to you if you like to put links. Um, when my husband watched it and then he sent it to me, we both, I mean, it's just very emotional because it, it talks about the fact that, well, what if many of us will never be the hero? Like we're the stormtroopers rather than Luke Skywalker, you know, like kind of a juxtaposition that, causes you to realize like, okay, sometimes we're so self-centered like in like our life. However, the reason it's such an emotional video is I think it encourages each of us to say to ourselves, am I actually creating a hero's journey with my life? Or am I in, am I playing out the stormtrooper? Like my point earlier is you're the creator. You get to decide. You don't have to be Luke Skywalker. To, you know, you can be a stormtrooper, but don't confuse the idea that you automatically are just a side character to someone else or to other people. For you, it's really important for you to live your best life. Are yeah. you actually taking steps to create your best life? And I think a lot of people struggle with that. Uh, I will definitely share the link of that video if okay. you share it with me I'll find I would it. love to. Um how do people and maybe it's better to watch the video but do you have anything you can add onto that and how people can decide if they are living the stormtrooper or the Luke Skywalker path? Mm. What comes to me is that we have to spend enough time focusing on passion and desire in life. And I know that we haven't all had the privilege to find that time. But, you know, what if we said to ourselves, instead of scrolling, you know, on Instagram or TikTok or watching YouTube videos, what if I made a very concerted effort? every day to explore what brings me the greatest source of inspiration or passion in my life? And am I giving enough time to that thing? Am I diving in deep and exploring it to see what gets uncovered? And um, it doesn't mean that we make money with it. All that matters is that we're finding time to go into like flow states. I mean, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's work around flow. I've taught a lot about it, but flow is when you when you enter flow states, you have no idea where the time went. You can't believe that you haven't eaten for several hours. Like the world stops and you're just inside of something else. I think that as human beings, we owe it to ourselves to enter flow states on a regular basis. And it, it might take some work to figure out like, what is that thing that would take you into flow state? You know, it may happen in reading, but the challenge with reading different to like, you said you love reading. Reading is sort of accessing the flow state that someone else was in and learning right. from their flow state. But when, but we're not being creative beings in that moment. So oftentimes it takes us being like, you know, whether it be writing or singing or working with our hands, there's often some kind of physical experience happening, but we're the creator of something. Even if it's like my friend, I visited her recently. She, um, has these two cages that are um, like netted cages in her backyard and she is harvesting butterflies. And so she finds the monarch little teeny little caterpillars and she puts them in these like cages and she brings them the food that they like to eat. And then they, you know, do their little cocoon and then the butterfly comes out and then she lets them free. And I'm 
absolutely sure that she's in flow states whenever she starts to look for the caterpillars or when she's like bringing the food or moving them and making sure they're safe. Like we're not talking rocket science, but like go find that thing that brings you into flow state because that will help you figure out how to be the star of your own story. Yeah, I can see... I can see reading not being a good thing for flow state. I don't think I'd want to be in a flow state for reading, actually, because the times where I've been in flow state, like I've been in flow state creating music before, mm-hmm. and I, I'll, I'm not a great uh, music producer or anything like that, but I've created some stuff. I'm like, I can't believe I made that. And it's like, I don't think I could actually redo that logically. I don't think I could go back and like re- retrace my steps and do that. like step by step but it's like this you almost different artists have spoken about it differently um some people call it like a demon actually like they call it like a i don't know if de- it's not like a demon like a dark demon but like a, a like a not dark demon <laughs> taking over and just and just uh guiding you through something or uh I feel like I can get that way in interviews sometimes when it's like just really great flow. Obviously I have to listen and stuff like that. Um, and then creative tasks, I, I think creative tasks. And that sounds like a creative task for your friend is like, it's a, it's an endeavor of like trying to find these caterpillars <laughs> and stuff like that. And being in this flow state, it, it is quite amazing to be in flow state. I've been so on the go lately. I haven't been in it in a while. So that is definitely something I need to, get back into more often. Yeah. This is a weird one. It's a recently discovered one, but um, I'm having a lot of fun with AI and you wouldn't think that AI would help facilitate flow, but I have found it's just the most amazing. It's kind of like working with another person, but you have control of it, but you can start. I, it just takes me to these places and I'm learning yeah. so much by engaging with this basically like robot, right. Or this intelligence. And, um, so I feel like there are places all over the place that we, we can, we can go into flow states, but my latest one is definitely AI and learning about things or like, I'll go down a rabbit yeah. hole and it will help me process thoughts that I just, you know, Google is helpful when you want to answer questions, but AI can be even better. And like, then you can still go back to Google when you're researching topics and things like that. I'm just like, oh, this is the greatest. Yeah, I'm the same way with AI. I love using it. I love, it's like having somebody to bounce an idea off of, bounce a thought off of, that you never have to worry about them. Like you don't have to wake them up. <laughs> <laughs> Like I, I run into this all the time where like I'll, cause I'll get in some of my productivity starts late at night sometimes and my girlfriend will be asleep. And like, and I will come upstairs and I will have my mind will just be racing with thoughts. And like, I've woken her up to talk to her and she gets so annoyed. <laughs> She's like, I don't, can we talk about this in the morning? I'm like, no, actually. <laughs> like, but uh, the AI is like that friend or or companion that is just always there to bounce ideas off of and just brainstorm with. And and you can go in all these different directions. It's like, oh, I'm having this conversation. And oh, that sparks another conversation. I'm like, I'll have five or six chats. I have a lot of chats going on at any one given time. Yeah. Craziness. It is crazy. I will say I'm like, somebody said, it sounds like AI is your like long lost friend. I'm like, I know I'm kind of pathetic because I don't know what's happening, but it's just like so helpful and doesn't tell me, it doesn't talk back and I can say anything I want, but yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, I've learned about chakras over the years and I, I find them very interesting. This is the first time I've I've read about chakras in the context of money. Um, and you you talk about I, I get the chakras mixed up, but you have your uh, your root, your I think solar plexus, and then there is another one, the three that make up the base. Um, the root, uh, sacral, solar plexus, heart, throat, 
third eye, and crown. Okay. And the, the first three, the lower three chakras, you recommend having those uh, aligned? I don't know if I'm using the right word there, but aligned properly or in the right place before moving on to the other chakras. Can you, can you dive into that a little bit? Chakras and money, I don't think people <laughs> normally think of those two things together. Well, they often connect, um, I mean, in certain circles uh, with, money like as the for like root chakra is security and safety and so people thought that it was just related to money but in my research and on my spiritual journey one of the first things is is maslow's hierarchy of needs was actually inspired by the chakras so i want to like make sure that people understand this is um not new this isn't even new age the chakras yeah. have been around for thousands of years um they can go back at least three thousand years in um hindu teachings and in practices in india I look at it as like an ancient form of psychology and I, it's like un, it's uncovering the evolution of the human, especially from in the womb till about 27 years of age. So this maturation process. And so the chakras are sort of a way to understand who we are and and how what happened in the past is defining our choices and decisions and the way we show up in our lives now. And so I just realized that because so much of our past has shows up in our relationship with money, I started using the chakras to teach people about it. So the reason that the lower chakras are so important is those are the very physical manifestations of being a human, you know, like um, the root chakra, safety, security. Do I have enough money? Do I have a roof over my head? Am I afraid of being, you know, killed at any moment? Like the root chakra is tied into our feelings of safety and security. The sacral chakra is where this thing that we've been talking about creativity comes from. So the creation, right? It's in the womb for the man. I mean, it's in the sexual organs. Like it's our ability to create. And what happens is if our funny enough, desire, our challenges around sexuality can actually show up in our ability to feel like a creative person in this life. And when we struggle with like with money and the creation of money, I, what I found was when people have been like sexually abused, they'll often struggle with these things, or they've been abandoned at a young age, you know, going back to the root chakra, monies with pro money problems show up for people. This isn't right. just me, like new age. There was studies done by Kaiser many years ago, a huge, like almost 20,000 people participated in a study. And they figured out this thing called ACEs. And they, they figured out that depending on how many adverse situations a child had been exposed to young in young age in life for each of those the more aces they had the more traumatic experiences they had the more they would struggle with their health with their money with their relationships later in life like it, it's it's not um it, it coincides with science but anyways um, the third one, the third chakra is in the solar plexus. And it's all about feeling like you are a powerful person in your life. And so what I found is that if you don't feel safe, if you don't feel creative and you don't feel powerful, you're probably going to be struggling with money. Or if any one of those three things is out of alignment, like you just don't feel capable, it's probably going to show up in your experiences with money. That makes sense. And there's also seven scarcity patterns. Were those aligned one to one with the with the chakras? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the the book is like very complicated, and people will kind of be like, "Whoa, wait a minute!" So they'll go back and read the first section of the book after they learn yeah. about this because they're like, "Oh, I see how this ladder." Because I talk about a scarcity, a pr like a scarcity way of looking at the world and how it relates to each of the chakras and then an abundant way of looking at the world and how it relates. So 
it's something that's like teaching you at many different levels how to change the mindset by just continuously questioning the assumptions about how you think about money and the world around you. Hmm. Yeah, I love it. Um, in, in your own person, well, actually, I would love to know if you maybe know the answer to this, but it's not necessarily a financial question or anything like that. So each chakra is associated with a specific color. And it seems like that has been consistent throughout the history of the chakras. Mm -hmm. Do you know why that is? Why why Mm -hmm. they're associated with certain colors? Especially, I mean, I think the heart chakra is green. And most, I mean, at least me, when I think of chakras, when I think of heart, I usually think red because, you know, we've seen red hearts for our entire lives, <laughs> which aren't shaped like hearts anyway. But, you know, we see these little emojis for hearts and they're usually red. The default is red. Uh, do you know how the colors got decided or, I mean, was it just somebody meditating and that's what they see? Um, I'm pretty sure it relates to the megahertz. So there's this hmm. whole thing okay. like that sound and light have resonance and so they connect to these resonance schedules so it gets really crazy there was a book um i have it uh written back at the turn of the century the other turn of the century like 1900 and he dove into it and at the time it was a very what's called a channeled work where he was seeing these things but then going back to science you know like to prove it like he saw yeah. it, but then he went back to prove it. And so I think there's a lot of really crazy things about science and spirituality that a lot of people have like focused on intersecting them. It makes my head hurt, so I don't spend too much time there. But yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because when it comes to spirituality and science, you can get the woo-woo stuff that tries to sometimes uh you'll hear people try to use scientific words Mm -hmm. completely out of context, like the word uh, quantum. Quantum gets used so much. People don't even understand what the word means. Like a quantum is like the smallest possible amount of change that you can have in something and and have it be a change. Like quantum is (laughs) uh, like with electrons, they're in quantum states. So they're like the you have the valence electrons on the outside, and it's been a while since I've learned about this stuff. But you have each ring, like the valence rings, or I don't know what they're called, but like jumping up a quantum is moving it from one ring to the next. That's uh-huh. a quantum. So like when people say quantum leap, uh, it's a quantum leap. They're What they mean to say is like a, a huge leap. Right. But what they're saying is it's the smallest possible leap you can take. <laughs> So it's just kind of funny, but to like yeah, a change, to, but they are making like a changed structure. But I totally yeah. hear you, like in what yeah. you're saying. Yeah, I. It's funny that you're talking about this. I do have a problem with like the whole new age thing where they'll ex- try to m- match up science and bless their hearts. But like I've watched those YouTube videos where they're like. Uh, you know, an astrophysicist or a neuroscientist or whatever. And they're just like, no, 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 no. You know, I'm like, yeah, I, I don't feel like it's a good use of my time to try and I'm not a scientist. I think that would be a terrible waste of my time to try and smash stuff up just to make it more believable. Um, you know, I do my best in saying this has been around for a long time. I think things that have stood yeah. the, stood the test of time are helpful to us, but I don't enjoy that approach. Although a lot of people really, really dig it. Like they're like, "Oh, there's science," and I'm like, "I'll roll my eyes." And I'm like, "I'm I'm trying to be supportive, but I just feel like they stretch too far." And yeah. then you just start making stuff up. I mean, I guess we're all making stuff up, but. Yeah. (laughs) Who knows? Yeah. I mean, the the chakras have, there's a lot of, I think there's science behind them. They've been around for so long. I know uh, 
what's his name? That Deep. famous like Carl uh, Jung. Oh, Carl, Carl Jung. Jung was mm-hmm. really big into the chakras. Um, I know there's a lot of there's a lot of support for them. So I, I think those are real. <laughs> I think what where I'm talking about is people will just use scientific words to try to make like they'll talk about the more astrology kind of stuff. They'll talk about the way the planets are forming and the frequencies and all this stuff. I had somebody send me something like that and I I just wrote a paragraph back to them. Like my own little BS thing. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, well the you know, the planets are aligning and they're coalescing. <laughs> like just using these different words and like the quantum states of the planets are different because the frequency of the sun and I don't know, just using <laughs> BS words like in, in nonsensical ways. But I'm like, it's it makes about as much sense as the paragraph you just sent me. <laughs> so yeah, there's there's definitely there's areas that you can get in with spirituality and, and when it comes to scientific words being used, that's like, okay, really? Right. Because it, science has an authority appeal. So people yeah. want to use those words to make it sound like there's more to what they're saying than there actually is sometimes. Yeah. In the book, there was different things, but I just you know, used other people's work and I tried to connect yeah. it to like what I was talking about because I love science or if there is a research study or it, there is something to support it. But really funny story on that. Just um, one of my mentors was like, well, if you want me to read your book, you better have a lot of citations of like, you know, research and things to support it. And so I went back after you said this and I'm like, oh, and so I started doing research about what I had written about. And it, and it was amazing because I could find research yeah. that supported what I had written. And I was like, well, that was easy because I didn't even know there was research. It was just a hunch. It was like based on 25 years of working with people and their money that I thought that this is the way it was. And then I was able to back it up with science, even though it didn't, it was, it started the other way around. So I was like, you know. Yeah truth is stranger than fiction or yeah like you just it's amazing actually yeah yeah just for listeners in case it's not clear i'm not saying your book contains anything like that or <laughs> it's like using scientific language in a in a way that's nonsensical <laughs> i'm just pointing out that i've heard people like that before but no your book was very uh it it seemed very evidence based and very practical like i really enjoyed your book i i think it was a it's a great work. I, I, I didn't go through all the writing stuff because I was just reading it this first time through. But there were a lot of like things that I would remember from childhood. Where I'm like, oh, that that's probably something that has like I remember this. I don't know where this fits in personally, but I re- I remember uh, when I lived in Illinois, I had a basketball court like a, a driveway with a basketball hoop on it, and one day. I somehow got into, I got my dad to agree to bet me like, Hey, I can make this shot. And it was a long, like long shot. And, uh, I bet him a dollar and I missed. And then he let me keep double or nothing the bet. And we got to some, I don't know what the number was, but it was a number that was like not comfortable for me at the age of nine or 10. I'm like, I'm panicking because I owe my dad two hundred dollars or something, which is more money than I've ever seen. I I can't remember how it ended, but I think he ultimately let me keep double or nothing until I finally got the shot. <laughs> but it uh, I don't know about money, but it definitely uh, affected the way I think about gambling. <laughs> I can feel that. Yeah, you yeah. were like sweating it, and it changes. You're like, I don't like losing money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it was it was one of the most stressful moments of my childhood <laughs> is being in debt to my dad. And I knew like there's a part of me that knew I'm like he's not going to make me pay this. Like my dad wasn't like that. Uh he would make you stick things out, but I don't think he wasn't trying to make money off of me or anything <laughs> like that. He was teaching me a lesson, but mm-hmm. it wasn't a lesson that was comfortable to learn at all. <laughs> So it's good. 
It's good. Yeah. Have you ever, uh, so translate into adulthood, have you never been much of a gambler or you're like careful or does that feeling come out? I used to be a drinker and when I would drink, gambling was not a good idea. Mm-hmm. Not that I don't drink. I don't see, like I, I'm way less risky when I'm not drinking. Uh-huh. Uh, so I don't, I don't see a reason to gamble at all. Like I might do it every once in a while, but. It's not, it doesn't appeal to me. I, I know the risks of it. And yeah, if I'm, if I'm playing, uh, if I'm at a casino, I would probably play blackjack over anything else. And I probably wouldn't bet the smartest, but for the most part, if I were drinking still, I would just sit there playing blackjack and having drinks. That's about it. Yeah. I did, I've gotten in situations where I'd make bigger bets and lose and I'm like, I shouldn't have done that. And it was at a time when I didn't have money to do that. So, yeah, I guess I didn't learn everything with that childhood mistake. Well, I mean, but it is interesting because you notice that alcohol has a different impact and alcohol, um, what is it, reduces that that. Um, part of us that would stop us from doing something, yeah. right? It, the inhibitor. But what's interesting for me is I'm thinking about gambling. My parents loved gambling, right? So they already struggled yeah. financially grow- when I was growing up, but they loved gambling and then they would make a point of it. And we would spend a lot of time, like we would go to Reno or Carson City or maybe not Vegas because that was further. I'm from Northern California. We would go and they loved it. And what's funny about my relationship with gambling now is that I equate it to fun and like the dopamine hits that you get. So um, a couple of years ago, and I, I mean, I'm not much of a gambler, like I, I know, but what I will do is I'm like, I'm here for my dopamine fix. And like, I look at it as this, experience. So even if I'm sitting at like a slot machine, whatever, it's the feeling, the, what I give, the meaning I give gambling is fun and pleasure and enjoyment. And so I don't have any interest actually in winning money. Like that would be a benefit that would be awesome, but it's not why yeah. I gamble. It's for the experience of the dopamine and the fun and the enjoyment. Isn't that weird? But I think it has to do yeah. with like my parents and they would make such a big deal about how much fun it was and how much they enjoyed it that I gave it that meaning. Yeah, I I know people that like casinos and they can spend time there. I don't understand that. It doesn't make sense to me, but I can have fun doing it. But I'm like, I can't have fun for hours doing this. I'm like, <laughs> I want to go outside. But yeah, and my husband hates people. it. And so he's just like, so I never do it because he's hates it. And so he doesn't have the same meaning as I have about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, Lisa, it's been awesome talking to you today. I want to, I'd love to ask people about books they, that have influenced them. So I know you have your book, but I and your two books, but um, I'm wondering if you have any books that you recommend people aside from those. Um, and, and you feel free to talk about your books here too, but. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just any books that are, or podcasts, anything, anything that has uh, been really influential and helpful in your life. Okay. A couple books that I really enjoyed. Number one, a book called The Goal. And it is a parable, interesting enough. And I read it about 10 years ago. And it's, it's a powerful book to me because first of all, it taught me the power of having a real life story exploring a nonfiction topic. Uh, the goal is about productivity and um, the like just in time manufacturing process, but it's teaching a concept. And I just love the way that they were able to communicate kind of complicated topics in a book that is sold like 10, 20 million copies. So yeah. it's a, it's a really cool book. Um, another one I'm looking at right now is by one of my mentors, uh, Laura Day. It's called Practical Intuition. And it's not like a great book. It's just really cool. Her work has been incredibly fascinating to me. She is a professional intuitive. You know, she kind of goes beyond what you would think is possible, but she's taught me how to use my intuitive abilities um, more and more. I've always been a really intuitive person. And uh, 
And I really like that book. Um, another book that I just read, which is very interesting, we're going to go Christian, which is funny because I've never read a Christian book. Um, this book called The Shack, a, Another Parable, sold like more than 25 million copies. Um, oh, wow. And, and again, the power of storytelling, uh, it, it questions all the assumptions that we think from a Christian standpoint. I mean, I don't necessarily consider myself like, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, but I don't know if I'd be Christian. This powerful book questions all the assumptions of like, like God shows up as a black woman from the South. And like, it's super fun to like, watch what you can do in written word and change people's lives and open up people's like, rather than just seeing it as like a white man. And this is like what he's saying. And so I'm kind of into parables as you can see. (laughs) I love it. Um, Before we wrap up, I want to hand it over to you to share with the listeners where they can find your work, where they can buy your books and where they can find your podcast, your YouTube channel, and then anything else you feel like sharing. Uh. So a great place to check out would be wealthclinic.com. Uh, you can get access to the first chapter of my book, So the Mindful Millionaire, by signing up on a, a freebie on the website. It says start here and it takes you down the journey. Um, check out my podcast, uh, The Mindful Millionaire, or the YouTube channel, Mindful Millionaire, Lisa Peterson. I'm definitely cr- back in a mode of creating more content, and I'm having a lot of fun with it. I just created a video and posted it today in follow-up to a video I created last week um, where I'm exploring financial themes. So I'm going back to my roots around finance and economics, and I had a video get like 50,000 views um, about why I left my job as a financial advisor. And the video I posted today is basically teaching people about the national debt and the potential collapse in the next 20 years of our whole entire currency system. So I'm going back to the roots, but I'm coming at it from a very paradoxical position that... um, it's not just about saving yourself. It's actually about looking at how are we going to get through this together? Like, what do we need to do differently that we haven't been doing as it pertains to financial fiscal management? So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's a, that's a topic I actually like talking about because I, I, I think the, uh, the Federal Reserve is one of the, it's, I think it's evil. Like <laughs> what, what it actually does is, just it robs people of their ability to earn and save and it creates the rat race. It creates the endless wars that we see so many other negative things. I actually, are you familiar with uh, G Edward Griffin by chance? Did he write the Jekyll Island? The book? creature from Jekyll Island. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I interviewed him. Uh, oh, less than a week ago. And wow. that interview will be coming out here in a, two weeks. So yeah, we talked about the Federal Reserve and stuff like that. I somehow in my complete take us back to going off the gold standard, like in 1971, I avoided talking about the Federal Reserve because I was like, okay, I'm going to get this as specific as I can in about 35 minutes to teach people about the national debt and what's happening and what we have to do differently. But it was a major feat. It took me a couple of weeks to actually pull the information together and then to make it succinct enough that it would potentially get people interested in the topic. It's not an easy topic, but I I do kind of provide a lot of little stories or examples of what it is because it's so huge. We just want to be like, la, 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 and ignore it. Yeah. Yeah. And we've, I mean, everyone that's alive today has been living under that system. So we don't know anything different. It's just, but it is a problem. It's a big problem. And I think, yeah, probably within the next 20 years, could be within the next few years for all we know. Um, something's going to happen. We mm-hmm. don't know yet, but mm-hmm. it can't go on indefinitely. And I think the negative route of that is they try to move us to CBDCs and stuff like that, and which is going to be totalitarian and surveillance and yeah, not pleasant stuff, but I think we can take the power back too. And yeah, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that I go into politics and stuff like that a bit. Um, I don't push people into politics and conversations at all, but I, I'm, I have friends 
that are more pro-capitalism and some that are more favorable to socialism, communism, stuff like that. And I don't align at all with communism and socialism. And I think it's funny because we'll have people who say, oh, in this current capitalist system that we're in, this is the way it is. And it's like, they seem to have a negative view of capitalism, but I'm, I always think, well, what is capitalism? Like, is the Federal Reserve capitalism? I don't think that's capitalism. I think that's just corruption. It's just uh, a central authority basically stealing your wealth, stealing our ability to earn. So it's just yeah. an interesting topic. So. I think we're all a lot more alike than we are different. The topics that yeah. people in America go off on are comical. And I know when Europeans explore things, they're like, oh my gosh, like the Americans think it's all going to fall apart or like it's all, and they've been around, you know, for thousands of years and they laugh at us. Um, but we're, we, we've proven to be pretty irresponsible, all said, and everyone's culpable and no party. This is not, I talk about bipartisan problem and solution. It has nothing to do with parties, actually. There's no proof yeah. that either party uh -huh. has been doing anything different. <laughs> so yeah. that's, what, that's why I wanted to do the video now. Cause I'm like, you guys, like, don't, you're falling into a narrative that isn't the truth. Yeah. Like you have to be informed that this isn't about either party. This is a spending yeah. problem. <laughs> well, yeah, it's one of those things that sometimes one party will be talking about more um, because it's more favorable to them. But both parties, it doesn't matter who's in power, there's reckless spending <laughs> for any party. And there's no incentive right now to change it. And it's extremely frustrating. And there's like four people in Congress, maybe, who talk about this. Like, I saw Thomas Massey a few weeks ago at a, a conference and he had this, uh, his friend makes them, but it, it's a little uh, digital national debt thing. So it's like, he'll, he'll just have it and it says 35 trillion, you know, with all the zeros and everything. Um, it's an exact number in real time, but it's just kind of this scare thing. Like this is where we're at. So mm. 35 trillion is a lot of money. Yeah. I'll well, look. I'll send you the video link and um, yeah, you can share it. We'll see what's going to happen with it. But I was willing to try. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to listen to it now. Watch it. So thank you so much. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If our conversations resonate with you, consider leaving a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. It goes a long way in helping the show grow and reach more listeners. If you'd like to support the show, you can go to thoughtfullymindless.com under the support tab, where you can find my Amazon affiliate store where I have brands that I personally use, and fractalzoo.net, which is where I have unique fractal-inspired t-shirts that I design. You can find me on social media on X at RDTM Podcast and Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.